Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a, a common way of preaching our Matthew 25 gospel text for today. You've probably heard it. I'll summarize it briefly for you, and we'll call this interpretation the social ministry interpretation. That is, when Jesus on the throne in glory says to those that when you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me, he's simply referring to all needy people in the world, whether they're poor or hungry or thirsty or sick or imprisoned. You've probably heard that one before. And you've probably heard it preached that this isn't a good works salvation narrative because it's because therefore, not if then. Maybe not in those words, but in verse 34, Jesus says to the sheep, come those who have inherited, they've got their inheritance from the Father before the foundation of the world. Right? Come you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And because of this inheritance they've been given, their life looks a certain way. They help those poor and needy. Well, I believe this is actually a misinterpretation of this particular text. This interpretation hinges on one major word, brothers how to be interpreted when Jesus says, the least of these, my brothers. Is this a general reference or referring to something more specific? Now, don't hear me saying that the exhortation for the care of those in need around you is not faithful to the scriptures. It most certainly is. As Christians, we are indeed called to help those around us who are in need. The hungry, the thirsty, the poor, the homeless, the sick, and the imprisoned. But I am saying that I think that that's not really what this text in Matthew 25 is talking about. So now you might be wondering, if the least of these, my brothers, doesn't refer to all people in need, who does it refer to? And if so, how does that change my understanding of the rest of the text? Well, to answer those questions, we have to set the stage that Jesus is setting here in Matthew 25. So we have Christ sitting on his glorious throne and all the nations arrayed before him. And here in this case, all the nations are those people who have ever lived on the earth to whom the word of God was sent, to whom the word of God was preached. And the next natural question would be, What's the criteria for the separation of the sheep on the right and the goats on the left? The trouble is we can't answer that question until we really understand who Jesus is talking about when he says, the least of these, my brothers. Because it is, after all, by his own words, the treatment of these people, whoever they are, that separates the sheep and the goats. So who are Jesus' brothers? Well, in the scriptures, apart from references to Jesus' literal biological brothers, this term always refers to disciples. It always refers to believers. It sometimes functions horizontally as from one believer to another. Do not be angry with your brother. Treat your brother a certain way as a disciple. And then Jesus uses this term for himself with those whom he has called as his disciples. So if brother here in Matthew 25 referred to all needy people in the world, it would be the only place in the entire book of Matthew that this word would mean that. Every other time the word brother is used, it's mentioning specifically the disciples of Jesus, the believers. Secondly, we have other places in Matthew where this word is used very specifically by Jesus. In chapter 28, verse 10, after Jesus has risen from the dead, the angels tell the women when they go to see him and he's not there, they say, go and tell his disciples that he is not here but has indeed risen. And on their way, they meet Jesus himself and he says to them, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers 
to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The exact same thing the angel just told them, except one change. Where the angel said, disciples, Jesus says, brothers. And it is, after all, in chapter 28, where all the themes present today in our gospel reading come to fruition together. The brothers, the disciples, all the nations, and the Great Commission, and the consummation of the age. I will be with you always to the end of the age. So here, the word brothers does not refer to just all needy people, but to those specifically whom Jesus has sent out with his word to all the nations. Now that doesn't mean just the apostles on the hill where Christ ascended, but all of those whom through his ministry in the church Christ has sent to bear the message of the gospel. That would be the sense of this word in our gospel reading today. The brothers in general are the righteous sheep standing before the throne, but they too are measured by the way that they treat the least of these, my brothers. It would be odd for Jesus to tell them that the way they treated themselves is their criteria. So therefore, when Jesus says, my brothers, he's referring to a smaller group, those people whom he has called and sent with his word. Pastors, missionaries, lay people, the, the specific post does not matter, but the task of being sent with God's word does. This helps us make sense of why Jesus then answers both the sheep and the goats who are surprised to find out that they have or have not ministered to Jesus himself. And he says that if you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. And here we can look back at Matthew chapter 10. You may recall my sermon on that a few months back, when Jesus sends his disciples out initially not to all the nations, but to the lost sheep of Israel. And they go out and they speak to the lost sheep of Israel, and some hear and believe and others reject them. But here's how he concludes that section. This is in chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus is giving a very similar explanation here in Matthew 20, 25. I'll reread it for you. In response to their question of, when did we do this for you, Lord, Jesus says, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then they respond, when did we do this? And Jesus says, if you have done it to the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. Jesus so closely identifies with those whom he sends out with his word that the way that they are treated is as if they're treating Jesus himself. He does this in chapter 10 when he sends his disciples out, and he says it again here in Matthew 25. So it would seem then that the least of these, my brothers, refers to the messengers, the disciples, the missionaries that have been sent in the narrow sense to all the nations to preach the gospel of Jesus. That means that the separation between the sheep and the goats are not based on how many needy people they have helped, but on whether or not they have received the messenger sent to them by God. And Jesus makes it quite clear that the reception of the messenger is an act of faith which, in which he himself is received. 
that changes our text a little bit, maybe from what we would initially have thought. Because it can be tempting as you read this text to think, I have to do a certain amount of good things in order to end up on the right side and not on the left. And that I need to keep my eyes peeled for those opportunities. Now again, that is true in a certain sense. Christians are indeed called to help the needy and to consider their plights more important than their own. But here in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about something more specific, the reception of those whom he sends with the gospel. So this text serves as a reminder of a few things for us. One is that the good news comes to us through human means. That is its first source to us. First, from Jesus himself, and then, by extension, through those whom he gave the word to and sent them out. Now, that isn't to say that you can't read your Bible on your own and receive God's word that way. But that's not the first place it's found. For before you received that, it was given to you by another means. The same with the church. First given through the apostles, written down, and then distributed to the church. And this isn't anything new. If we look throughout the scriptures, this is the way God has always interacted with his people. He has called someone and sent them to his people with his words and says, speak to my people. And then it usually ends with a phrase like, thus says the Lord. Secondly, that it's a call for us to remember Christ's messengers of the gospel and pray for them. It could be a congregation caring for their pastor, as Ascension does so well for me. It could be your individual support of a missionary or a congregation's support of a missionary, as we had a couple of people here a few months back who have been called to bring God's word to a people who do not yet know it. But it's also a reminder for those who are sent to bring the word of Christ that they don't go alone. Christ so closely identifies with those he sends that he says, when you receive them, you receive me. It's also a reminder of humility to make sure it is, in fact, the message of Christ that is being shared and preached. A certain amount of humility is necessary in accompanying the task of bearing God's word, for it is not you that is important, but the word in which you bear. And it's clear by what Jesus says here that you must, if you are one who is sent out with the word, be willing and will endure hardship and deprivation for the sake of the gospel. The text, after all, speaks of helping the least of these, my brothers, in states of hunger and thirst nakedness, sickness, and imprisonment. I'll close today's sermon with a quote, and then we're going to say a prayer together. This can be kind of a tricky thing to navigate. Because after all, pastors aren't super special people, nor missionaries. They don't have special superpowers. They're sinners, just like you and me. But yet here, Jesus asks us to treat them as if it is he himself coming to us, bearing his word, receiving him, and all that he has to offer, which we do so joyfully, weekly here at church. That emphasis on reception is no accident, for it is his work that has come to you through human means for you. Here's the quote. It is not just the cause of Jesus and his demands that live on in the Christian missionaries. Rather, behind the ever-changing faces of the preachers of the gospel, there stands the Son of God himself, and behind him, God the Father. The authority of the exalted Jesus and his presence have been given to his disciples, with the result that they have become, to use a Pauline metaphor, members of his body. Master and servant are, in a sense, one. What wondrous news this is for us. 
that Jesus has so closely identified himself with us in the giving of his word that we have become a part of his body. After all, that is what we sometimes call the church, the body of Christ. A fitting thought to meditate on the last Sunday of the church year. But we don't need to look at this image of Christ in glory on his throne and the sheep and the goats with fear and worry or questions of, have I done enough? Have I been faithful enough? But instead, giving thanks for the gift of faith given in Jesus Christ from whomever he sent to you to bring it through his word to your ears, taking root in your heart and now today gathered in worship of him. On the last day it will be the same, that gift of faith assuring you of the promises that were given to you in his word. I want you to take out your hymnal. The prayer we're going to pray together is on page 311. Because each of us don't know when we might be sent by Jesus with his word, nor when we might be called to care for those who have been sent to us and to receive them. So we're going to be praying the prayer entitled, Look for Guidance in Our Calling. It's the second one from the top on page 311. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again to make everything new. Amen.